Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a real delight to be here um, and to present some of my work. This talk is going to be uh, much to do about synthetic chemistry, not so much about stem cell biology. I was a little bit nervous about coming here to this beautiful setting, and Mark assuaged my concern that it's okay to talk a little bit about synthetic chemistry in this talk, so, so bear with me. I am going to have one slide in, on, on stem cell biology, though, so let's hang in there. So the roadmap for my talk this afternoon, brief talk, is going to highlight a, a synthetic chemistry approach for a devastating disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, for which there's no cure, and this chemistry is, is shown right here. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the pathogenesis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and then highlight this chemical-based approach, because DMD, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, is a primary defect in the instability of strided muscle membranes. And so we've made a synthetic surrogate of the missing protein dystrophin that we think stabilizes these defective muscle cells as a molecular band-aid, if we will, for both dystrophic skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. So that's the roadmap. So uh, I have an important disclosure. This technology has been licensed by Frixis Pharmaceuticals. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy, as I've mentioned, is a devastating, uniformly fatal disease of progressive strided muscle deterioration. It's devastating in the sense that there is no cure for this disease. In fact, there are no clinically ready uh, therapeutics that can uh, demonstrably uh, halt, reverse, or substantially slow the progression of disease. So it is a very uh, sobering and dire condition. This is an X-linked uh, recessive disorder. So it affects about one in every 4,000 live male births. So there's about 20,000 uh, boys in America that have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, about 300,000 boys worldwide. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy is owing to inherited defects in the largest genetic locus in the human genome. That is the dystrophin locus. It weighs in at about uh, 2.5 megabases of DNA. It encodes a very key cytoskeletal protein called dystrophin. You can think of this protein as a molecular shock absorber for muscle systems. It resides just underneath the sarcolemma, so here's the muscle membrane. Here's the contracting sarcomere, so it really forms as a bridge between the elements that are generating force and the dissipation of that force across the muscle membrane. In Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the genetic lesions are such that there is no functional dystrophin present in the human body. So this cytoskeletal protein is completely blocked. And this is critical because it bridges and its uh, C-terminus uh, membrane-spanning proteins, the dystrophin glycoprotein complex shown here, and on its uh, N-terminus gamma actin. So in, in essence, like a molecular shock absorber. So it doesn't fundamentally affect the ability of muscle cells to produce the force, but it fundamentally does affect the ability to dis dissipate those forces. So when you go through contractile cycles, there's forces uh, generated in the longitudinal plane and also in the axial plane that need to be dissipated. So again, muscular dystrophy, a fundamental defect in muscle membrane fragility and instability. Um, just to give you a backdrop on ongoing clinical uh, approaches right now, because this is a genetic disease, it's not surprising that forward uh, therapies and clinical trials include exon skipping strategies, aminoglycoside-based nonsense mutation read-through therapies. Obviously, these are all highly allele-specific. Uh, they also tend to be very skeletal muscle centric. I didn't mention that 40% of who you are is your skeletal muscle system, but also uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy involves the respiratory, respiratory assist muscles and the re um, respiratory diaphragm, but also the myocardium. So upwards of about 30 to 40% of boys die ultimately of cardiac failure. So we really need to be considered about uh, new approaches that could be complementary to these gene-based approaches that would treat all DMD muscles regardless of the genetic lesion, and that's our uh, strategy for this application. We entered this about 10 years ago, and this is Suichu Yoshida, a very talented MD, PhD, postdoctoral fellow in my lab, and he brought to me, and we developed a, a, a beautiful uh, template here to now study the functionality of single living cardiac myocytes, and this is by virtue of these uh, interesting micromanufactured carbon fibers that allowed us to attach on one end to uh, living end of a, uh, one end of a cardiac myocyte, uh, a piezoelectric device to control the length of the cell, and then the other end, another carbon fiber allowed us to record directly the force that the single cardiac myocyte is generated. And what we did is a very simple mechanical maneuver in which we 
just distended the cell. So for the engineers in the audience, you would recognize this as a classic for viscoelastic property uh, tissue, for example, of passive tension extension characteristics. So it's like taking a rubber band and just extending that. And then you record the relationship between the degree of extension and the resistivity to that distension. So in, in essence, a stiffness measurement, and that's what we're doing here. The cell's not being electrically stimulated, we're just distending it. And this, of course, happens with every contractile cycle of your heart, as your heart goes through a squeezing motion, and then it relaxes and diastole gets reprimed with blood, the muscle cells are being passively distended. And it turns out that this is the critical point where the membranes are under most stress, where they're being distended passively, and I'll show you the data on that using this system. And so what Suichi was able to do is to be able to take these dystrophin-deficient cardiac myocytes, and this is from the MDX mouse model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and just do this simple mechanical maneuver. This is just one distension within the physiological range of which heart cells experience this. And we found that after we restored the cell to its normal length, the cells became, at certain levels of distension, unstable. They started to fibrillate and eventually hypercontract and die, whereas when we took the dystrophin replacement, myocytes, we could do this mechanical maneuver all day and not have any effect on cellular contractility. So fundamentally what we're able to show in this work is that, yes indeed, this is a problem of membrane instability or membrane heightened fragility. It's owing to alterations in transient calcium entry, as I'll show you in a moment, into the cell, ultimately leading to the reduced compliance of the cell and the hypercontraction and cell death. So I'm just going to share with you uh, sh uh, in this short talk just some of the uh, records that you get with these types uh, of maneuvers. And so here's the actual uh, distension length, so the cell's at a basal length and you distend it and return it to normal length. And here's the actual force that the cell's resisting that distension. And what we found when we tugged on these cells, at certain uh, points we found these little blips in intracellular calcium. And we knew that this calcium was coming from the outside in because when we removed extracellular calcium, we essentially lost these uh, blips in intercellular calcium. So this is revealing to us that it was distension of the cell through these passive distensions was allowing uh, ephemeral calcium inappropriately in to the cell, and it's not through calcium channels, because when we had calcium channel blockers, this fundamental process was not uh, affected. In fact, when we did greater levels of extension and, and greater levels of these calcium blips, as we called them, eventually there was a catastrophic increase of calcium within inside the cell, and that led to the immediate uh, hypercontraction and cell death. So this is what goes wrong in heart cells when you're dystrophin deficient. So uh, these cells are fragile, they're unstable. We've searched for uh, a therapeutic that would, uh, we term the molecular band-aid for dystrophin muscle, and we came upon this particular chemistry that I'm gonna talk to you the rest uh, of the talk uh, this afternoon. So the class of chemistries here are referred to as um, pluximers, or trade name pleuronics, uh, brought to us by BASF. This was actually developed, it's a family of tri-block copolymers that have a central core moiety, beads on a string, if you will, of polypropylene oxide moieties that are relatively uh, hydrophobic owing to this methyl group, and then sandwiched or flanked on either arm of the polypropylene uh, moieties are polyethylene moieties that are hydrophilic on either side. So it's like a, a, a molecular abatross, if you will, that had a linear array of these um, block copolymers in the classic ABA configuration. Now this chemistry was developed some 60 years ago, not for biomedical applications, but for what chemical engineers get really excited about by, as excipients or emulsifiers or surfactants, for example. In fact, it's used uh, very frequently in drug delivery as emulsifiers and as solubilizers. We were aware of the literature when we discovered the this uh, phenotype in these dystrophin deficient cardiac myocytes, uh, that there were some beautiful uh, biophysical data uh, developed by Kai Lee at Chicago, who made artificial membranes and showed that these pyloxomers could engage with these monolayers of, of phospholipids when you distended them. In other words, change the density of the phospholipid. And this got us to thinking about, is that what we're seeing when we distend these heart cells that become unstable? And can we use something like a uh, pyloxomer to, in effect, uh, stabilize those membranes? And so that was our foray into these uh, chemistries. 
And so the, uh, I think the, the, the most significant data set I can share with you that uh, Suichio developed was to take a cardiac myocyte and use a particular dye. This is FM143, which is a soluble lipidic dye. It has, um, it does not in, uh, cross and tag biological membranes, but it does uh, specifically for us in the presence of a lipidic environment. So the experiment is schematized right here. So you have a resting muscle cell here. When you apply the FN1-1-3, it will intercalate into the outer leaflet of the phospholipid membrane and give some background level of fluorescence. If uh, this is a dystrophin deficient uh, 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 muscle cell and we tug on it, that is deform it, and in fact, the, if it does have dysfluidity or micro tears as we call them, uh, the dye should be able to gain some level of entry and then intercalate into the inner leaflet to increase fluorescence. And so when we did the experiment, so this is arbitrary fluorescent elements uh, units over here as a function of time after one single distension of the cell, uh, when we take uh, a dystrophin deficient cell, that's these blue uh, triangles right here, we found a steady increase in fluorescence. That meant the dye was gaining entry. And when we uh, looked at normal cells at these red um, uh, squares right here, we did the distension, no entry at all. And what was really exciting to us is that when we took the dystrophin deficient cells and then applied this molecular band-aid, if you will, these membrane stabilizers, we did the stretch to the dystrophin deficient cells shown in green and absolutely no entry of F1143. So this is our evidence that these uh, membrane stabilizers were doing as advertised. They were stabilized in the membrane, preventing molecules from the outside coming in, and also very importantly, preventing molecules from the inside gaining uh, egress to the outside environment. So this is our working model uh, of what we think is happening. So here's the outer membrane of a muscle cell. Here's the sarcomeres. The red spheres are to represent uh, calcium and the serum. Uh, when we do passive distension of the cell, we think there's uh, dis owing to fragility of the membrane. Calcium ions are uh, permitted uh, inappropriately to gain access within the inner, inner uh, sarcomeric structure of the cell. Uh, eventually that becomes catastrophic, leading to cellular death. In the presence of these membrane stabilizers, by owing to the unique structure of these molecules, uh, that is the hydrophobic, hydrophobic core flanked by hydrophilic uh, uh, arm elements, uh, stabilizing the mem membrane and preventing uh, calcium from gaining entry to cause hypercontraction and cell death. So uh, we then went from the mirroring model of muscular dystrophy to the gold standard in the field. This is the golden retriever, a muscular dystrophy dog that was spontaneously obtained. Muscular dystrophy occurs in, in all mammals that are, that are known. And this was led by a postdoctoral fellow, Dwayne Townsend at the time. And what we found uh, immediately upon systemic delivery of this membrane stabilizer is that when we look for markers of cardiac injury, we found that um, the saline arm uh, treatment group had an elevation of cardiac injury markers, but the dogs that had treatment, and this is chronic treatment going over eight weeks of the membrane stabilizers, completely blocked the increase of this a marker of myocardial injury, that's a cardiac TNI molecule. And very importantly, and I'll just show you a uh, focus on these panels over here, these are the classic pressure volume relationship of the interventricular, left ventricular pressure and volume relationship. Dogs that were given saline advanced to elevated end diastolic pressure. So this is a classic dilated cardiomyopathy that is the sine qua non for Duchenne boys. And uh, dogs that were treated over this time period randomized to uh, the uh, membrane stabilizer group completely stabilized the left ventricular functionality and geometry. So this was a very, I think, exciting preclinical observation that we made. So. Um, uh, I'd like to just now share with you this idea that uh, membrane stabilizers uh, may be an effective treatment, therefore, to strophic uh, skeletal muscle. Um, I'm not a drug delivery expert, and so I've gotten to be uh, 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 more accustomed to this literature, but all uh, key elements of pharmacodynamics, which is essentially the study of what a compound or drug does to tissues, cells, or organs in the body, really didn't know anything about how these peronics or paloxymers work. We didn't know anything about optimal route of delivery. And this turns out to be very critical. If you give a bolus injection, these molecules do, can have the capacity to mycelize, for example, and would that therefore disrupt or abrogate their functionality? We didn't know much about dosing, and we didn't know anything about chemical optimization. So I'll share with you some of those data on the remaining period of my talk.
Um, a breakthrough came for us uh, last year, and, and this, this paper is coming out on molecular therapy in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, this is led by Evelyn Wong. The data I've showed you thus far is all dealing with the cardiomyopathy of muscular dystrophy, so all related to the heart. Uh, when I talked to parent groups about this, yes, they were uh, obviously aware that their son ultimately is likely going to die to some cardiomyopathy or heart failure, but in the meantime, they saw their son not be able to walk and then in a wheelchair and then need respiratory assist. And so it was very sobering at that time. We didn't have uh, the appropriate pharmacodynamics of these membrane stabilizers to affect in any way limbs. Uh, muscle in any animal model system. So Evelyn made a breakthrough uh, by roots of delivery, and, and I'll just show you these data sets here. This is a classic lengthening contraction injury. Thank you, Laura, I have five minutes to go. And so this is a, this is be an example if you're running down the steps to the beach, your muscle cells are incurring a lengthening injury as your muscles are being extended as you're running down here. It produces significant forces and damage and places great tension, if you will, or stress on the muscle membrane. In dystrophin deficient system, that markedly accelerates the decay of the functionality of those muscles. And that's shown right here. We're doing a series of lengthening contractions. One in the open symbols here are the normal muscles. The dystrophin deficient um, diamonds are shown here. So muscle functionality is rapidly decaying by these simple lengthening contractions. When we delivered uh, through pharmacodynamic optimized uh, routes of delivery, the membrane stabilizer, stabilizer P188, we completely blocked this, uh, uh, this loss of this forced decrement. And the only thing that I've seen in, in my experience of this type of protection, if you will, that is through either a gene therapeutic or a transgenic animal approach where you deliver specifically to muscle a nearly completely functional surrogate of the missing dystrophin protein. So we're using a synthetic chemistry approach that we think is substantially protecting these muscles. Um, I just want to now just close with where we're at in the field. We're, we're showing, I think, very excellent preclinical data on, on the first-in-class molecule, and that's this molecule P28, which has this particular structure. The blue is to represent the block that's the uh, polyethylene oxide, the core is polypropylene oxide, and the other arm is uh, the PEO. And it's the relationships between the composition, mass, and architecture of these molecules that we just simply know. What is the important functional elements of these molecules? The chemical space is large. It's about 10 to the 20th formulations. So we don't know anything about the uh, architecture. Is the tri-block architecture really critical? Can you reverse it? Can you form di-block structures? Can you uh, affect changes by uh, modifying the hydrophobicity of the core element, for example? We don't know anything about that. So what we like to do is to pursue with first-in-class molecules and then through uh, collaborations with my colleague Frank Bates at the University of Minnesota to now form a, a, a really a serious and, and from my view, the first serious look at structure, function of these molecules, can we find the best in class molecule for membrane stabilizers? And will this in turn give us keys to what are the features, the chemical features of these molecules that, that confer fundamentally membrane stability? Um, and so I'm just going to leave you now with what have you learned about these molecules in terms of how they actually work? And we collaborate now with Yuk Sham who's a uh, assistant director of the Center for Drug Design at the University of Minnesota. And we've made an all-atom model of the muscle membrane, shown, fossil uh, lipid membrane shown over here, all-atom model of the block copolymer. And now we can do molecular dynamic simulations of the nature of the engagement of this molecule with membrane. And we're finding uh, through series of manipulations of the protein and the density of the uh, phospholipid core that these molecules seem to be resting on top, engaging with the membrane. And so we think it's the nature of this insertion that's very critical for the stabilization, inferring that the hydrophilic core, hydrophobic core, if you will, is very critical for this process. But again, uh, these are very early days for structure function. I am going to leave you with one uh, stem cell slide. So people are using this technology platform for human iPS cells. And it, by virtue of culturing the cells in the presence of these proonics or membrane stabilizers, it does preserve stem cell functionality over the long term, uh, including uh, uh, blocking um, uh, programmed cell death in the system and excessive uh, intracellular calcium that can occur, occur in some of these models. So I'll now uh, leave you with the uh, final slides here of conclusion. 
what I hope I shared with you briefly this uh, afternoon is uh, the um, development of a molecular band-aid for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We view that this is a, um, a potentially exciting uh, component to what might be viewed as a bundle therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy because it has effects to protect both cardiac and skeletal muscle in vivo. And uh, it's very critical because it really addresses the primary defect of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, that is membrane fragility. Uh, the other exciting feature that I've already emphasized is that it's not allele dependent. So uh, obviously all the exon skipping trials that are going on are very specific to the inherited allele. Uh, the other issue, of course, that would have to be addressed, this, if this were to have traction in human patients, this would be considered treatment that would be a lifelong treatment. It, to me, it would be analogous to the maintenance of individuals with type, ton, type 1 diabetes, for example, who every day are managing their disease by uh, uh, regular assessment of systemic glucose and then giving themselves life-saving insulin each and every day. And by analogy, if this worked, um, this would be a very similar platform. So this is the end. I think I've highlighted all the key people. There's Evelyn, who's going to be defending her PhD thesis very soon, uh, and uh, other colleagues that I mentioned as I went along. I also, I think, I highlighted Frank Bates and, and Yuk Sham. I'm at the University of Minnesota. This is our beautiful campus. This is the mighty Mississippi. It's on its 2,000-plus journey from Minnesota, the heartland, the northland, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Mexico, and this is where we hang out. So if you ever get a chance, come up to sunny Minnesota, and we'd love to, uh, we'd love to have, you, uh, have you visit. Thank you very much.